Hey guys, welcome back to the Joe Jaguar Show, your best friend in astronomy, science, and telescopes. I got something here which is super coincidence, or maybe the heavens and the gods listened. Okay, remember the video I did of the Skywatcher Heritage 6 inch? And I just said last week that what about an 8 inch? If they were to make an 8 inch, would you guys take it? Would you guys buy it? traveling on a plane. It was one or two days later and I saw this telescope and I thought, okay, I gotta get it because this might solve the problem. Remember, because we don't know if Skywatcher is ever gonna make a Heritage 200, uh, just because the flex tube is kinda similar, even though I showed many reasons why that wouldn't be airport travel, uh, that one. Uh, a Heritage 8 inch might be, but this might be the next best thing. Can I make it work? Okay, let's get to it. Okay guys, I'm gonna get nice and close. This is a Celestron, if you guys remember this, a G8N telescope, 8 inch Newtonian. So it's like a short tube, 8 inch. That's what it looks like. So. I don't know if you guys remember this, or maybe if you guys weren't in the hobby yet. This came out about 1999, I think, to about 2004. And what Celestron was trying to do is make an eight inch, but extremely portable. So this is an F5, as it says, but it's in a F2.5 tube. So yes, it's a Burge Jones design, but it's not as bad as the cheapy ones that you always hear about. Let's talk about it. Okay, so first, this is a CG5 EQ5. Were popular for a long time. I really liked them because they actually uh, can carry a decent load, uh, 25 pounds. I think Celestron and me back then, you but most people would say 30 is a little bit overrated. So let's say 25 pounds is the normal for a CG5. Now, this is the first generation uh, models that came with uh, aluminum tripod. And then after that, they went to inch and a half steel legs, two inch steel legs. And now everything now is back down to 1.75 inch steel legs. Two counterweights, you know, everything is pretty much the same. You could add a polar scope if need. You could add single or dual axis drives here. And you have a decent, uh, you know, so somewhat portable uh, large aperture telescope. Now, if you upgrade the aluminum legs to the steel legs, you got something more solid. But let's talk about this guy. Let's start with the easy stuff. 8x50, straight through. Finder scope and bracket comes with the older type or the first generation two inch uh, focuser, which is fine. Uh, inch and a quarter, adapter here, has a locking nut here, uh, but it's an, only a single speed. You know, it's not the most smoothest, but you know, back then this was definitely acceptable. Uh, rings, uh, I don't know if this dovetail, it's kind of short. Um, was original, but that's okay. You got your dust cap. Now look how big the central obstruction is. It's pretty big. It is center dot right down there. But also here is the corrector. Now most times, most people are used to, when these Burge Jones design, normally they put a, like it's a just a Barlow lens right here under the focuser, right? Now, what Celestron did, well, you could take this out. And you can collimate it this way. Uh, there's some screws. It's, I don't know if you can see it on the video. Like here, there, and there. Three different screws. Uh, and then you have a, like, um, a flathead screwdriver type here. It's not the most easiest to collimate. But if you look also down here, where you could see there, that glass right there. Okay, there we go. That shows it a little bit more. So that's the housing that holds the corrector. So instead of it being up here in the focuser, they now put it here in the inside the light 
tube. And it looks like it's about a two inch um, corrector plate. So I would say that this is like a Burge Jones design, but it's a better version. Normally when you think of Burge Jones design, we normally think of the four and a half inch, the 5.1 5 in, 5 inch or you know something in that range, sometimes even a six inch uh, one. And they put again, the um, corrector lens, which is just a very cheap Barlow, like one of the, like, you know, a, a, a couple dollar Barlow, two times Barlow to amplify it. Um, this is also the same thing. And they also use, of course, the spherical mirror. Now let's stop there and talk about, now back then in the late nineties, uh, well, even before that, if you guys really look at like, uh, I know some of you might think, oh no, spherical mirror, no good, right? But that's not true. A spherical mirror can be made well, you just have to have the right design for it. So unfortunately, those small beginner telescopes are a bad design, plus they're using cheap quality corrector plates. If you look at like, you know, Max Utov's, if you look at SCTs, those are corrector plates, yeah, the SCT has a, it's not a parabolic mirror, it's a spherical mirror. So you can make a good a quality, you know, telescope with a spherical mirror. You just got to design it well. Now this one would be better. And it's not, again, a $2 Barlow that you're putting in the eyepiece. This one is a full two inch aperture. Now again, the, the secondary mirror is kind of big has a big housing that's about, uh, I don't know, three and a half inches long, and then that corrector's housed in there. So it's actually in the light path before it hits the secondary mirror and then bounces it. And it's a better quality corrector plate. It's not a full glass corrector plate like a SCT or Max Sutov or a Schmidt Newtonian, right? But it kept price down by putting a good quality corrector there. And it does correct for a lot of the aberrations and uh, coma and stuff like that. Um, so that was good. So don't confuse this with the very cheapy stuff. Now, again, let's talk about one more thing. Let's go back. So in the 90s, let's say, when this came out about 99 to 2004, uh, they wanted to make something kind of portable. As you can see, this guy's very short. Um, it's almost, I would say, just a few inches larger or longer than an eight inch SCT. I don't have an SCT right here, but I think an eight inch SCT would probably go to about here. So it's literally two to three inches longer. So it is almost, I think even the weight is about the, almost the same weight of an SCT as well. Okay, so back then it was actually really expensive to make a parabolic mirror. It was very commonplace to have uh, again, uh, telescopes made, if you look, uh, you know, Meade had the Schmidt Newtonian as well for a long time with the LX55 and then the LX D75. So a lot of the companies made still spherical mirrors um, and then with the corrector or, you know, that or made them long enough. So if you remember those Newtonian reflectors that were 8 inch F6, F7, F8, uh, because the longer you make it, the better it corrects all that. Uh, you know, bad aberrations. So anyway, what they try to do is, unlike the cheap Burge Jones design that puts it over there, they made a better corrector in the light path, about two inches, and that was okay. Now, the thing is, they stopped making this at about 2004, so it was only around for about five years. After that, at about 2005, is when most manufacturing and pricing of parabolic mirrors started to become cheaper and cheaper. So then everybody just went with a traditional parabolic mirror. Um, and of course it has to be longer, you know. This is actually pretty short. If this was F5, uh, like all normal uh, eight inch reflecting telescopes that come on an EQ mount or an AZ mount are normally about F5. So literally would be about that big. The Dobsonian versions are always F6 version, a little bit longer. I guess they want to try to make them a little bit higher so you're not crouching down as much. But on an equatorial mount, uh, you can make them a little bit shorter because the height is already soft. 
So that's why these were popular back in 99 to 2004. Other companies made different types in the same era, you know, for different reasons or maybe for a lot of the same reasons as cost-wise, parabolic mirrors were pretty expensive. So normally what they did is just make them longer with spherical mirror. So Celestron tried this. And then once the prices of the parabolic mirrors were becoming cheap enough, everybody just converted to that. Um, so now the thing is, if you compare this to a, you know, a parabolic mirror, that is still going to be a, a bit more sharper and clear. So most people would probably buy that now. However, saying that, a lot of companies now are making F4 systems. If you look like the Skywatcher, Orion, you know, all those other companies are making a 8-inch F4 um, type of reflecting telescope, more generated towards the astrophotographers, but they even have 8-inch F4, a 10-inch F4, 12-inch F4. So they are making them shorter again, but with parabolic mirrors now, not with correctors. And of course, the price of those F4 systems are very expensive. To make a good quality mirror that fast, it actually costs more. The second downfall of that too, is that you probably will need a, a coma corrector, and those are not cheap. The cheap ones are three to four hundred dollars, and the expensive ones could be five to six hundred dollars, seven hundred. So that's the downfall of going that short. Now, this guy is supposed to perform like an F5 uh, with a corrector plate. It's supposed to be not bad. So it's much better than the junky Birds Jones design, but it is not quite as good as a full, you know, if this was a um, eight inch F5 with a parabolic mirror, and of course, reducing that secondary by 50% with, with all that housing and all that stuff, the parabolic version would be a bit better. But this is a good compromise for somebody that wants ultra portable. Because if you look at that size, you like for me, again, if I'm traveling with this guy, this is almost the size of the Skywatcher 6-inch Heritage. In fact, okay, I'll show it quickly to you. The next video is going to be, I'm going to compare them side by side so we can get our hands dirty and figure it out but I'll just quickly go get it so you can kind of see the size. Okay, so here is the Skywatcher Heritage 150. Now, if I put them side by side, you can see it's very close. Or if I put it down here, you can see up here, it's only a few inches different. So to have a uh, eight inch, practically the same, you know, almost the same length of the six inch, one is actually for me i thought like i should get it now why some of you might say why not get then an eight inch sct because virtually it might be two three inches shorter um wouldn't that be more ideal yes and no sometimes when i go in the deep sky viewing in dark places i want something that's wide because there's a lot of things out there that are big and I've taken, if you guys look on the channel going back 2019, 20, I've gone to Bortle Zone 2, uh, where I brought a Celestron 8-inch SCT. And normally, uh, I will bring like a 4-inch F5 refractor for the wide stuff. But a lot of times, a SCT in the 8-inch is, you know, 2,000 millimeter focal length. So even going as low as I can go with a 2-inch diagonal, with a 2-inch low-power eyepiece, like a 32 uh, and a even a 56. There's some stuff I can't even see, like maybe only half uh, the field of view because they are just so huge. So an SCT is just kind of narrow. I mean, not super narrow, but you know, F10, 2000 millimeter focal length. This guy is a thousand millimeter focal length. So it's not 50% wider, it's 100% wider. So, you know, as my travel scope, I probably would like something that's an F5 or a thousand millimeter focal length. Uh, the, the heritage was 750, so I can go really deep. I can put a two inch eyepiece in this guy where I couldn't on that and go super low if I have to for those big stuff. And you collect a lot of light. You just gotta be careful you don't go too low that you see the secondary obstruction. Uh, but anyway, that's what it is. Um, 
I don't know if that was just fluke, but it was just literally one or two days after I posted that video about an eight inch, would they ever come out with one? And I saw this, I figured I better go get it because if it suits my needs, then I'm all set. Oh, I just noticed there's a screw missing right here. Okay, I can fix that. Anyway, guys, that's it. Like, comment, and subscribe. If you know anybody that's maybe getting into astronomy, send them a link to my channel. If you know anybody in the forums that are asking about videos that I have, please share it. And I also have a members now videos. Uh, it's 99 cents to become a member. Uh, there's at least one video a month. Uh, that's definitely worth uh, 99 cents. Um, and why not you? Why not me?